Go ahead and take your Bible tonight, if you would, please, for our scripture reading to John chapter 14, please. John chapter 14. I'd like us to read together the first three verses of John 14, and since they're just three verses, we'll just read them in unison tonight, and uh, all of us beginning with verse 1, and we'll read 1, 2, and 3 together in unison, and as we usually do, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 1 of John chapter 14, ready? Let not your heart be troubled, ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, Father, I pray you add your blessing to the reading of the Scripture tonight. And, Lord, we're thankful again already for the message we've had through song and the cantata, and yet, Lord, we desire to hear from you, from your word this evening. And so, Lord, I pray that as we look at and turn our thoughts to your word tonight and the truth you'd have for us, that you'd help each of us to give our attention to your word this evening, that we would, be, we would all have ears to hear what you would want to say to each of us tonight. So, Lord, help us to be attentive. Help us not to miss the, the, the truth you may have for us this evening. Help me as I bring the message and help each individual as they listen tonight. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. It was December 17th, 1903. After four attempts, the Wright brothers finally flew their flying machine for the first time. Wilbur rushed to the telegraph office. And he sent the following message. We have flown for 12 seconds. We'll be home for Christmas. That was his message. Upon receiving the telegram, their sister Catherine went to the local newspaper office and told him the news. Two days later, the local paper placed the following headline on its front page. Wright Brothers, home for Christmas. They totally missed the flying part. It's, the being home for Christmas trumped the fact they flew for 12 seconds. I'm sure they were trying to fly, and they were the first to fly, of course, but most important to sister was they were going to be home for Christmas. We often ask people that, don't we? You going home for Christmas? Or if you, where you are is home, we ask if maybe your children are coming home for Christmas. But we often ask people that because there's something within every one of us that thinks about home at Christmas time. There's something special about that. In fact, there's songs been written, I'll be home for Christmas. That was written during World War II, and it was specially for the soldiers that were overseas that if they couldn't come home, at least they'd be there in their dreams. Are we the famous, oh, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas? We, we, we think about Christmases from the past or Christmases from our childhood that uh, sometimes the memories might be better than what the actual <laughs> Christmases really were like. In fact, one writer spoke of our tendency to romanticize Christmas by saying this, every Christmas Eve functions like a kind of time machine. It takes us back to every other Christmas Eve we spend on earth. For some, it's the smell of pine or the taste of a roast turkey or a spiral ham. It's mom and dad sitting around in their bathrobes sipping coffee while the kids chase the new puppy through a sea of wrapping paper. For others, it's just a night, the night may be a reminder of the way their life should have been, but never was. 
Those who've looked all their lives through other people's windows at such scenes of domestic bliss, but have never seen it as an insider. Some can't wait to go home for Christmas, and others are not really looking forward to being with family because home's not necessarily a happy place. For some, they'll dread going to their Christmas gathering because for the first time there'll be an empty chair there for a loved one that's no longer with them. Christmas might be warm or it might just be plain awkward. Your home might be beautiful or it might be broken. You may be filled with delight or you may be getting ready to be disappointed. Could be happy or could be horrible. Someone said there's the home we long for and there's the home we have and there always seems to be a gap in between. Joseph and Mary, we know they were away from home that first Christmas. The angel came and told Joseph, don't fear to take Mary to be your wife. But it didn't last too long because not long after they were married, they they had to go to Bethlehem to make the trip. The shepherds, because of the nature of their work, they were far from home. We knew that the wise men traveled far away from their home to find the young Jesus and worship Him. Jesus, we know later on in his life, made Capernaum his home, but the Bible also says he had nowhere to lay his head. And we know, of course, Jesus was literally very far away from home because he left his home in heaven to come down to be here on earth with us. I think there's a longing inside of each of us that no human home's ever going to satisfy. It's a longing for a heavenly home. You know, the word home is used 54 times in the Bible. And I just have two, two simple thoughts I'm going to share with you tonight and uh, let you get on your way. But number one is this. We have, a, we have a longing to be at home with God. I think every one of us have a longing. Every human being has a longing to be at home with God. Ever since Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden because of their sin against God, I think there's a a homesickness and emptiness in in the soul of every human being that only is going to be filled by God. You know, when Genesis in Genesis 8 9, after the flood and Noah set a dove free, the Bible says the dove couldn't find rest for the sole of her foot because there was water over all the surface of the earth. A little phrase, soul of her foot, literally means. It couldn't find a home. It couldn't find a home, so it came back to the ark. That's a pretty good place, a pretty good description for home, uh, a place for the sole of your feet or a place to rest your feet. It's really supposed to be a place of safety. That's what a home's for. I want you to look at Psalm, a couple verses with me in Psalms. Would you please look at Psalm 84 in your Bible? If you turn over to Psalm 84... David, in this psalm, is crying out for God. He's showing that longing in his heart he has for God. And he says, How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. Notice verse 2, My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Then he mentions somebody in verse 3. Notice he says, Yea, the sparrow hath found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee. Selah. He's, He's almost jealous here of the birds that seem to have a home. And David's longing for the home and to be with God. And he's almost jealous over the sparrow and the swallow that he mentions here. Notice in Psalm 90 and verse number 1. This is not David now in Psalm 90. This is Moses. 
This is a psalm written by Moses. Moses who spent most of his life wandering in the wilderness. Once he left Egypt, he had nowhere to be called home. And he says this in Psalm 90 and verse number 1. You notice what he says? Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place. Lord, You've been our home in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever Thou hast formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. Moses said, I want to dwell with You, Lord. That's what I desire. Notice Psalm 91 and verse 1. He that dwelleth, he that is at home in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Malachi 4 and verse 6, we mentioned it this morning, I think with John the Baptist, that He'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and, and the children to their fathers. And I believe with all my heart that what man is really homesick is he's homesick for God. Well, we're missing. Listen, we don't, need to, we don't need to make America great again. We need to make America look to God again. That's the secret. And that's what we're missing. That's the missing ingredient. They had another program on the radio this afternoon about the drug addiction and the opiate crisis and such. And finally one man called in and he hit the nail on the head when he said, you know, you can, they're, they're talking about, um, you know, putting people in jail or putting them in treatment or what to do with it. And one man finally called in and he said, you know, until we realize it's a spiritual problem, we're never going to get it fixed. And that man is exactly right. There's a spiritual component. What is it that, that, that we want to look for in, in these things? What we're looking for is the only thing that God can fill. It's, the, it's that emptiness and that, that loneliness and, and, and looking to take away pain or sorrow or whatever it may be. And listen, the one to take care of that is God. That's who you need. That's why oftentimes our family gatherings or our Christmas celebrations are incomplete. We're not just looking for a Christmas from our past. What we're longing for is we're trying to we're trying to get broken pieces and scattered pieces and put them all together again, but that's never going to happen until we get to our heavenly home. That we're unable to do that. The emptiness is a thing only God can fill. All the fun in the world isn't going to fill it. All the fame in the world isn't going to fill it. All the all the 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 the, the uh, family is not going to fill it. Achievement or wealth won't fill it. A bottle or a pill won't fill it. Only God can fill that void. Only God can take care of that emptiness. I want you to think about something. If you lost everything, if you followed the big California fire they've had, it devastated hundreds of thousands of acres, and I think last count, over 300 some homes and businesses. What would you do if you lost everything? What would you do if you lost everything? If you lost everything and somebody said, what's the one thing you want? If you lost everything, what would your response be? You have to, you have to stop and think about that. Don't, don't be so quick to just say what you think everybody would want you to say. But what would you really want? You know what David said? David said he longed for God. David said, what I want most, what I want when everything else is gone, if I had to start all over again, just let me have God. That's what I'm looking for. David would say, you're my God. You know, all through the Bible, personal pronouns are important. David didn't just say the Lord is the shepherd. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He restoreth my soul. It's, it's always a, a personal relationship that is emphasized in the Bible. And God says, I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people. He always personal 
in the pronouns that he uses. And so, David wants God. What do you really want? What do you really want? I was reading about a farmer who they said lost everything. After 22 years of farming, he had borrowed millions of dollars and paid back millions of dollars. But in 2001, everything went belly up and he lost everything. Lost the farm, lost the house, lost his furniture, lost his car, lost the farming equipment. He had nothing. And he's asked the same question. He says, what does God want to teach me? What do I need to follow after the Lord? How would, how would God want me to respond to this? David would say, having lost everything, the one thing I want is God. That's what I long for. Is the one thing you want God? Take everything else away and you start all over again. How would you start over again? So, well, just start me out with a thousand dollars. Start me out with a million dollars. Start me out with a business. Start me out with a house. Give me health. Give me. Or would you say, just give me God? What do you want? Do you, do you have the longing for God? The passion for God that I believe God puts in every human being? But the second thought I want to share with you tonight is just the flip side. And this is amazing to me. But I think the Bible makes it clear if you look in John 14 again. Not only does man have that emptiness and man ought to have a desire and a, and, and a longing for God, but you know what's amazing? God has a longing for us. God desires us. That's an amazing thing. Did you read what Jesus told His disciples here as He's preparing them to go to heaven? He tells them in verse number 2, In my Father's house so many mansions were not so I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Well, why is He doing that? Well, verse 3 tells you. I go and prepare a place for you. I will, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself. Why does He want us there? Because where I am, there you may be also. Jesus said, hey, you know what? Wherever I am, I want you to be there with me. Isn't that an amazing thing? It's one thing for us to desire to be close to God. You may be here tonight and say, you know, I'd really like to uh, get close to President Trump. Or I'd really like to get close to Vice President Pence. Well, you may want to desire all you want, but you're not getting close to him. That isn't going to happen. Because they have to have the equal desire to want to be close to you. Or that just isn't going to take place. No matter how much you want it. The great thing is, God puts that desire in us to be close to Him and to desire Him, but He desires to be with us. That's an unbelievable thought. You know, the Bible says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's John 1 and verse 14. You're in John. Why don't you just look back at that verse, would you? In chapter 1. Chapter 1 and verse 14. John 1. Are you alright? Everybody still awake? You okay? Alright. John 1 and verse 14. And the Word, of course we know the Word was, in, remember verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word's with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. Okay? And the Word was made flesh. Who's the Word? Jesus Christ. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Uh-oh, then there's a parenthesis in there. And we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's, by the way, that's what Christmas is all about. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He came down where we are because He wanted to redeem us. He wanted to save us. He wanted to be the sacrifice for our sin, but He had to become like us in order for that to happen. I read this story and I thought it was, it was a good illustration. A grandfather was visiting his grandson and he walked into the family room and he saw the toddler standing in a playpen crying. His face was red and tear-stained and when 
The grandson, little Jeffy, saw his granddad, his face lit up, and his hand reached out for help. Out, Papa, out! Uh, what grandfather is going to resist that plea? So he walked over and reached down to lift his buddy out of captivity, but just as he did that, law and order came into the room. Mom came in. Papa's daughter. And she spoke sternly. She spoke to her son, Jeffy, you know better. You're being punished. Just leave him right there, Dad. And she marched back out of the room. Now Grandpa doesn't know what to do. His tears and outstretched hands are tugging at his heart, but he didn't want to interfere with his mother's discipline either. He couldn't stand being in the same room but not be able to do anything. But he couldn't just turn his back and walk away on him without feeling like a traitor. So then he got an idea. Since he couldn't take Jeffy out of the playpen, he decided to climb in the playpen with him. Hmm? You know, that's what Jesus did for us. You know what he did? He climbed in with us. And he took upon himself... He became a man and took upon himself the form of a servant. Was made in the likeness of flesh. In the likeness of man. The Word became flesh. You know, that's different than any other world religion there is. None other has their God becoming flesh. To die for them. He tabernacled. The Bible says He tabernacled with us. That's what it means when it says He dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. He, he pitched His tent among us. Now, I'm not a... I, I never was a big camper. Okay? Uh, my, my camping would be at a motel somewhere. Okay? That's as, that's as rough in it as I want to get. Are you with me? Is that preaching? Yeah. You. But my wife's family grew up camping. They, would, uh, they had a camping trailer for years and uh, would, would go camping. And I understand when you camp... It's difficult to be too private. Are you cam any campers in here? Some people like to go camping? Oh, yeah, several of you guys, all right? Bless your heart. And I understand, and, 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 and I think it's right, when you're in a campground especially, uh, there's not a whole lot of privacy. You might as well get to know your neighbors. They're going to hear and see everything you do anyway. You're shaking your head. You think that's true, right? And to say Jesus tabernacled, or pitched his tent among us, it literally means that he wants to be on familiar terms with us. That he wants to know us. He wants to interact with us. It's the same word tabernacle as used in the Old Testament. That tabernacle was the portable tent that they would uh, close up shop when God would lead them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And uh, when that began to move, they'd pack everything up and they'd move with it and follow it until it stopped and then they'd stop. That was the tabernacle. After spending three years with the disciples, I think some of the disciples finally found a home. I think it was Brother Wallace we were talking, he was mentioning that, you know, we don't, we don't have a lot of background on the twelve disciples. We don't know a lot about what they did before they became followers of Jesus. Because that's not the significant thing that's important to us as far as them following Christ. But it would be interesting to know a little bit about what their, some of their backgrounds were because certainly with Christ they found a sense of belonging. With Christ they found a sense of identity. With Christ they, they had some uh, purpose for sure in life that maybe they had before and maybe they didn't. But then John 14, Jesus kind of shocks him when he says, I'm leaving you. Huh. Now what are we supposed to do? What do you mean you're leaving? What are, you, what, 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 are you, what are you getting to? It really shook him up. Why do you think Jesus had to say, let not your hearts be troubled? He knew they were troubled in their heart. Lord, this isn't the news we wanted to hear. What are we supposed to do now? And so he tells them about a home that He's preparing for them. I'm preparing for you a home. I want to give you a little background here, and we've referred to this before, and we might have, we did it today sometime. I don't know if it was a morning message or Sunday school, but 
you know, most people in, the, in that culture lived in a, a housing arrangement. In the center would be a courtyard. Animals would walk around, and there would be fire pits for cooking. And then around the outside would be the dwelling places, the, the homes where family members would live. It was the, the family compound, if you will, in our terminology. And what happened was, when a young man would get married, the parents are arranging the contract with the girl's parents. And what they're doing is they're negotiating a price. What it'll cost the, to, to, for their daughter to marry their son. That's where that phrase comes, you're bought with a price. And so they'd, once they settled on the dowry or the price of what, what it will be for the marriage, the couple would be betrothed or they would be engaged in our terminology, though it was much stronger than an engagement in our, in our words. The date, no, no wedding date would be set. Most of the time when couples get engaged now, the normal question is, when are you getting married? What, what's your date? And, and, you know, it wasn't that way in Jewish culture. You were betrothed and you were committed to each other, but no wedding date was set because what happened was the groom-to-be had to get to work at building an additional dwelling place onto his father's house or there in the compound. And he and his father would begin to work on that. Now, he was highly motivated to work quickly because when it got done, his dad would say, go get your bride. So he would work very diligently. And whenever he said, go get your bride, the bride would have to be ready. Any time that he showed up and the wedding party would then begin the, the whole processional all the way over to the groom's house. See, the bride would never know when the groom was coming to get her. There would be a parade when he did get her back to their new home. That's what Jesus, that's the picture that these men would have thought about when Jesus was telling them, I'm going to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there will be also. And he's telling them, I will come again and receive you unto myself. I'm going to come. And I'm going to get you and take you to my home. Because where I am, there ye may be also. Those were wedding words. You see, Jesus is the groom. And He's preparing the place. Who's the bride? We are. We're the bride. And when the Father says, okay, it's ready, then Jesus is going to come get us. And the Bible says that He's going to come in the clouds and we're going to hear the, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The dead in Christ are going to rise first and we which are alive remain. We'll be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. What a day that'll be. Wow. We'll be with Him forever. There's only one way to get there. And it's not the cradle. It's the cross. He came in the cradle because He was going to the cross to die for our sins. That's why Jesus concluded in John 14 when He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by Me. Jesus went to the cross so you and I could have a home. We could have a home in heaven one day. Notice later on in chapter 14 and verse number 23. Jesus answered, verse 23 of John 14, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Saying, when you, when you love me and keep my words, my Father is going to love you. And you know what's going to happen? We're going to make our home with you. Isn't that amazing? God says, I want to be at home with you. It's interesting that Jesus is preparing a home for us when He had no home to lay His head on in earth. When He walked this earth. There was no room for Him even when He was born. And despite the fact that the world has kicked Jesus out of 
<laughs> its home, Jesus will gladly welcome us into his home. It's pretty ironic, isn't it? Jesus says, I'm getting a place ready for those of you who believe in me. I think we're all searching for a home. The problem is, sometimes we get too attached to this place. We kind of, I think sometimes we're like Lot's wife. When the angels came to get her out, they was like, it was like pulling teeth. Lot himself, for that matter. Kind of, I, I picture it sometimes as the angels pulling him and Lot has his legs locked and his heels dug in and there's just two ruts going out through the sand, you know, as they pull him out. Just, just resisting all the way. I don't want to go to heaven like that. I don't want to go to heaven like Lot's wife and as we're caught up in the air, be looking back. I want to eagerly look ahead. Look forward to that time of seeing the Lord. You know, we said in Sunday school this morning, there's only two places to go when death comes. You either go to heaven or you go to hell. There's only two places. A place of wonderful joy, eternal joy, or a place of everlasting punishment, everlasting torment. There's only two places there are. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Therefore we're always confident that whilst we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. Then there's a parenthesis that says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, I want you to look in the last book of the Bible with me, Revelation 21, would you please? Revelation 21. We're almost finished. You can put your tray tables up in the upright position. We're coming in for a landing, all right? Revelation 21. This is a vision that God gives John, and he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. There was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now watch verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them. And they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Doesn't that sound awful good? If something can be awful and good at the same time, but it sounds good, doesn't it? Bad English, but good communication. But you know, the entire Bible is pointing us as Christians that the best is yet to come. Our best is yet to come. You know, this is as bad as it ever gets for you and me. The best is yet to come. We couldn't get to God, so God got to us. Jesus is Emmanuel, as we heard in the play tonight, because it means, Emmanuel means, God with us. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the Creator of the universe came home to His creation. And God chose to be with us, to live in our neighborhood, so to speak, so one day we could go live with Him in His home, in heaven. I don't know about you, but if I be home for Christmas, that's okay with me. Oh, I'm not talking about home where I grew up. I'm talking about home where my Savior is. And that would be all right. You remain unfulfilled and restless and homesick until God becomes your dwelling place. Until you are at home with Him. You don't have to find your way home. God found His way to us. You've never received Him as your Savior. Receive Him as your Savior tonight. Christian, He's all you need. We sing, but it's not just a song to sing. It really is true. Jesus Christ is made to me 
all I need. All I need. Are you at home with Him? Do you desire Him tonight? Do you, do, do you like David? Could you say your loving kindness is better than life? That I, I long for you to be with me and me to be with you? That I want to dwell under your wings? I want to dwell under the shadow of the Almighty? I just want to be at home with God. To feel at home with God. Will you yearn for God? Will you desire Him as much as He desires you? The great news is, we have that in us. That longing for God. But even better news is, God has a desire for us. God longs to be with us. Wouldn't you like to be with Him? Spend time with Him this week, will you? You know, one of the, one of the things that happens at Christmas time is the schedules get all crazy. You you're, you're sometimes have visitors and you sometimes have get-togethers to go to and you have uh, uh, different parties or gatherings of families and the schedules get off and sometimes work schedules are different. You know what happens? Your time with God goes by the wayside. Don't let that happen. Don't let that happen. Make, look, keep Christ at the center of your Christmas. Make sure you keep Him first. Make sure you spend time with Him. Make sure you desire Him. If you draw nigh to Him, He will draw nigh to you. And you can celebrate Him each and every day. Christmas at home. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. And Lord, thank you so much for the wonderful truth of you desire to be with us. And I pray, Lord, that we each would have that yearning and that passion and that desire to want to be at home with you. To dwell with you. So just as you desire to be near to us, we would have that same desire to want to be near to you. Lord, I understand tonight that each of us are just as close to you as we desire to be. If we want to be closer, it's up, it, the, the problem is always on our side, not on your side. And so help us tonight, God, to desire you. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. Don't let us get caught up in all the things of this life. That these things take our affection away from you. And our desire to be with you. Thank you Lord that you're preparing a place for us. That where you are. There we may be also. We look forward to that day. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. If you lost everything. What would you want? I hope you would say from your heart, I'd still want God. i got to have Him. And then I ask yourself this question, does your life show that now? Are there so many other things that you turn to first before you turn to God? Do you have a yearning? Do you, have, do, do you satisfy that longing you have do you satisfy that with God? Or are you trying to satisfy it with other things? No amount of family, no amount of fun, no amount of fame, no amount of money is going to satisfy that hole that only God can fill. Not only for an unsaved person, but for a saved person as well. Be at home with God. He desires to be near us. He desires to be close with us. Will you be close with Him? I want to hear tonight and say, Pastor, the Holy Spirit of God has spoken to my heart tonight. I appreciate you praying for me this evening. He stopped at my seat. He's spoken to my heart. Pastor, pray for me this evening. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. The Lord has spoken to your heart. I want you to respond to Him tonight. You might just bow the knee and thank Him for loving you. 
Thank Him for coming here, being one of us, tabernacling with us so that we could one day live with Him. Whatever the Lord has dealt with your heart about, why don't you respond to Him tonight? Heavenly Father, thank You for speaking to hearts this evening. I pray You'll have Your will and way in each and every life. Lord, thank You for Your great love You have for us. We realize tonight we only love You because You first loved us. And I pray, Lord, we would bow the knee to You tonight and just thank You for the Word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. One day, that one day, we will dwell with You. Have Your way now in this invitation and I'll thank You for it.